welcome to a very special episode of Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. We have a friend, an early adapter of Relay2, and more importantly, InsureTech Queen, CEO of Alchemy Crew, a podcast uh, diva, guru, I don't know how to call you exactly, Sabine van der Linden. Uh, Sabine has over 25 years of experience in insurance. Uh, she uh, started Startup Bootcamp in SureTech in London, in Hartford, um, and really has uh, pioneered innovation in an industry uh, and, and has become a top 50 woman in tech, fintech, insurtech, you name it. So without further ado, Sabine, welcome to the pod. Thank you for very much for having me, Alex. Thank you. Looking forward to supporting the pod and seeing what is ahead of me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Sabine, uh, y- you have a really interesting starting point with, with ins- insure tech uh, before it became popular and the buzzword in the industry and has really, you know, from the very early days, pioneered a a connection between you know very large institutions, hundreds years in the making, who are now doing very very interesting things. So tell us about that journey. Why InsureTech, and where have you seen the corporate innovation take uh, you know this industry and other industries that you've touched? Yeah. So, Alex, I have to say, you know, I'm French. I moved to the UK. 30 years ago and like many of us we fall into insurance so I did you know the interview with a big financial you know institution banking but I actually like the relationship based uh, approach that existed in in the insurance so I made my way into Lloyds of London and and learned the basics of regulations and 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 what we call specialty insurance you know satellites you know, very expensive people should such celebrities and big buildings around the globe. Think about things we don't want to think about, but where would a pandemic be insured at Lloyds of London? Where would buildings which crash, um, you know, are crashed by, by planes be insured will be Lloyds of London. And so uh, after pretty much 18 years working in insurance and doing consulting work and um, technology and strategy consulting work for, uh, you know, the top 100 companies around the globe, you know, working for big brands. And seven years ago, eight years ago, I decided to actually work um, for a smaller organization. First, investors approached me and said, you know, it's time for you to give back my dear Sabine. So I went into fintech. One year after I went into insurtech because I realized what was called fintech would happen in insurance. So 2015 was the year, if you remember, Alex, mm-hmm. when um, Anderson Owitz and Sequoia said, you know, insurance is ripe for innovation. And I actually listened. AXA, Strategic Ventures, set up their fund. Kamet, which is their, CV, is their um, venture build, was set up as well. And so that's when insurance technology, InsurTech started. Some people said, no, it started much earlier. For sure, you had the guide wire of this world and a lot of players already doing technology innovation. But there Mm -hmm. was a shift in 2015, 2016, as you remember, where we had startups, you know, young players like you saw in Silicon Valley coming in. And it didn't help to work with the big players, the big companies. So... I guess one of my advantages and my uh, capability after 18 years working with those companies was to become that the bridge, you know, helping mm-hmm. those ventures to understand what a business model looks like, an operating model looks like, how you communicate effectively with those big players, as you know, um, very process heavy, very, very regulatory and compliance heavy. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to have fun, you know, to actually see where the world of technology was going. So, I mean, when you think about insurance technology or insure tech, you need to think about fintech, health tech, all the other right. players and, you know, the other the buckets. Insurance technology is one place. But what is fascinating about insurance technology is it touches everything. Think about risk mitigation, risk, yeah. risk yeah. transfer. It's everywhere, yeah insurance is everywhere and so that what makes it um 
exciting. You know, people don't find insurance sexy, but I think it's probably one of the um, sector which is becoming sexier because they have to digitize and they have to serve their customer better. They have to become relevant every single day. Mm-hmm. Whether you look at people like you and I, you know, having to insure an iPhone or an iPad or at big companies which need to insure their people. Uh, Now it's all about sustainability or weather risk. So think about the underlying technology we need to do that, right? We need geospatial data. We need dynamic AI models. All those stuff are the things I look at every day. So it's really interesting, Sabine, the generally the there's sort of this disconnect where insurance at some point was, you know, the the defining risk taking innovative industry, right? And I, I remember reading a book uh, called Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk by Peter Bernstein, and mm-hmm. which which really explained the roots uh, and the innovation of like a lot of modern economy, the maritime trade, everything that we take for granted really came out of these organizations. And when you're working with them now, how are you helping them find those those roots, right? Like, because there's still, you know, pockets whether it's tech or not tech, there's pockets of insurance, especially in that, in that specialty areas that are really innovative and there's new products being introduced all the time. So how are you finding pockets of innovation that can help spread across larger institutions that maybe have grown more conservative over time? You know, and do you, have you found a profile of a corporate innovator? A lot of, you know, people that are wanting to work with insurers like myself, you know, and, you know, we kind of, we can get stuck with people that really can get stuff done within insurance and departments that have more ability um, to do it. And then some teams want to do it, but they're just not equipped for it or their personality is to play it safer. And um, it's, it's disorienting a little bit from an outsider, you know, to find, find those hot spots. What's your take and has it changed uh, over time? So, you know, when you think about insurance, think about the fact that there is probably 5,000 insurance companies around the globe. And when you talk about innovation, I think, you know, you need to talk to the top 100. Actually, I have to be honest with you. Now, Mm -hmm. when you look at every country, you will have the top 20 insurers in every markets, Mm -hmm. which actually cover Pretty much 100%, nearly 100% of the premium, which is under real. And I think it's very important to understand the dynamics, right? Um, So every country, France, the UK, Spain, has its top 20 insurers in every lines of business, home, Mm -hmm. travel, motor, so on and so forth. And technically, if you look at the top 20, you will represent 100% of what is underwritten. Oh, you know, 98%. Mm-hmm. So once you actually have this understanding, your focus tend to be really limited, if if I may say so. Then to win in insurance. But, but so hold on. So we're we're at, we're eliminating brokers for now. So we're just focusing yes. on the underwriters. Okay. So just so to be clear. Insurance. Okay, got it. Okay. But then, you know, if you want even to look at the brokers, I mean the broker markets, um, it's full of consolidations now. I think, mm-hmm. you know, I used to work when I was with Lloyds of London with one of the top four brokers 25 mm-hmm. years ago. Now it's top 25 because they are very niche and very mm-hmm. specialized. Um, and what you find is the top brokers, the way they grow is for acquisition. So they go and mm-hmm. acquire and acquire and acquire and acquire and acquire. And that is what makes them super big. Now, when you look at the reinsurers, let's just be clear, you don't have, I mean, look at the top 20 insurers. Those are their insurers. Because their insurers are insured, the insurers. Mm-hmm. And so it's not as if you have, you know, thousands of insurers. What you do find today mm-hmm. is that some of the insurers, um, I don't want to give names, but for example, some version in Bermuda and in the Cayman Islands actually focus on innovation. They do insurance, but they use a lot of technology and a lot of startups to actually help them build the new business models of tomorrow. That's very interesting. So we've noticed ourselves that we, to our surprise, we have, you know, tend to work with innovators and we've had, you know, reinsurers who want to communicate in a different way. We have, you know, carriers, insurers, and then we have brokers. 
But the one common theme that we've heard, um, and I'm curious of what your what your take is, that there is this pressure in the industry that is very complex and hard to understand for 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 audience. Um, you know that it still has information heaviness, right? Like to to it, right? Nice. Whether it's regulatory or just in general. Um, they they are trying to consolidate, hey, we need to be thorough. We need to provide all the evidence. We we are regulatorily have to do this. But at the same time, we need to show our customers or our future customers that they're more than a piece of paper, right? And so that's sort of where we find, you know, why we love the industry, right? Because we tend to take that piece of paper or, or, you know, analog piece of paper like a PDF and make it interesting, engaging, understandable while still providing the evidence. But what's your take on what is forcing that need to innovate, right? And there's probably like the underlying underwriting model innovation, right? Which is one pocket, but then there's probably another one, which is customer experience innovation. And, um, you know, how important is that? What's, where is insurance and kind of compares to other areas of FinTech innovation or other, other industries that you've seen and, you know, is that again fits into your the top ones are the ones that are innovating, or are you seeing this starting to spread across across the market? I think we are going through a, a major reshaping of industries, um, Alex. I mean, when you think about what is a generative AI bringing into market, we have to realize it's going to change all industries. Um, when you look at the surveys, you know, whether insurance or fintech, let's say whether insurance or banking, you know, they tend to still be quite low in those ratings. And the main compared to fashion or luxury mm -hmm. goods or retail. And the main reason is because people can't touch an insurance products. You know, they pay a premium and then someday maybe they will get a claim paid. And so the insurers and the reinsurers and the brokers are trying to change that dynamic and become more relevant in the eye of the customer. I think today, because of what I said, generative AI, you know, insurance is 6 to 70% about paper and data. Mm -hmm. so paper, written content. And yeah. what do we do every day? We read, we write, we learn. And our power is about transforming the information to make it simpler for people to understand. Yeah. So I can see why insurance companies, reinsurers or brokers will be interested in understanding how Relato is able to drive value for them. It's because we are in this information economy yeah. and data is the all of everything and being able to make decisions, but also express that information in a simpler way is crucial. Right. It's sort of a merger of information with consumption, right? So if right. you have the information economy, but the information is not consumable, then you you know, you're it. not you're not you're not really leveraging it, right? And and then the consumability uh, becomes even more important the more information there is, right? Because then you need to find the 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 perfect nugget inside, you know thousands of pages across hundreds of documents. People don't read their contracts, yeah. you know, think yeah. about it. You know, you, you buy yeah. an product, people don't read their contracts. And if they do read it, they often do not understand them. And you wonder yeah. why do those contracts need to be that long? A lot of startups and young ventures are trying to make the contract simpler. Um, now with GRITV, you even have capabilities to actually look at the contracts and help people question the contracts and explain yeah. it with, you you know, virtual assistant. So, all this coming together is about simplification, make it easy for people to understand, to make good choices for themselves. Well, so one thing that is corollary to what, you know, this information is also and really fundamental to insurance business, as I understand it, is trust, right? You right. mentioned the, the value of relationships in the kind of B2B part of the business, but in general, trust, um, and, transparency. trust and transparency, right? So, so that combo and you know that sort of fits into you know piece of paper. It's not a it's not a relationship, right? It's sort of your your kind of a formality paperwork. Hide behind other expressions like hide behind small print, right? Like so that sort of skepticism uh, inherent with the small print. So how do you see insurers and innovators in the in the industry, you know, overcome trust? 
um, and and this sort of transparency, right? So we, we talked about making some things more consumable, but there's got to be more, right? Like wh what other what other innovations are you seeing? So one big part will be branding. You know, okay. there's this thing called brand tech, but think about branding and the power mm -hmm. of brand and authenticity. And what we what I've seen in the past twelve months is recognition that you know customers are not stupid. And mm -hmm. so brands have a lot of power if they actually build in the right way. Okay. Um, but as you know, you know, whilst I build R&D labs and commercial labs with insurance companies, um, at the same time, what I realize is communication and authentic communication is a very big part of it. It's why often I'm approached as well by those big brands to help them touch specific segments with simpler authentic messaging so we say branding storytelling okay will actually become highly differentiating you know you can have the technology you can have the to be and all those things but the way you differentiate will be around your power to storytell um, to target and, and communicate with the customer in very unique ways and also it will be about the creativity i mean regardless as to all the stuff you know, generative AIs can do, you know, even imagery. And at the end of the day, you still need that level of creativity, which makes it less mass market, right? Much more different for segments you are targeting. So that branding is going to be a big part of it. And you mentioned trust and, and transparency, education. I think education okay. will be crucial. Mm. And, and I guess what I'm hearing is that there's already have been some challenges about per perceived commoditization, right? Where it's hard to distinguish between policy A versus policy B, especially if they're really abstract, right? And sometime in the future. And, you know, so the, um, now that that is sort of even, you know, so it's part of brand is part of that differentiation, but it's also part of um, expanding from one line of business that you're supporting somebody into the other and so it's, so it's sort of cross selling up stuff okay got it but you know remember insurance you know i don't know how you sell even your your credit cards but price price is is important i mean the customer of insurance is very price sensitive mm. so so the individual customer of insurance is very price sensitive you know imagine this year you know some people have received a, a raise and increase in their motor home you know travel uh insurance premium you go straight to your insurance and it's like what is going on why am i having an increase when i didn't even have a, you know a claim and they say it's because the rates have increased now when you look at corporate customers you know the way they start negotiating on those is either they get higher whether you know um um excess they they, mm -hmm. they take more on themselves um, or they actually go for much more dynamic uh, type of policies where there's much more monitoring happening. Now mm -hmm. with data, you can do that. So imagine between you and I, when we are driving, for example, and you can actually monitor the, the driving patterns, you can go uh, and have a premium which goes up and down. So we go into that more dynamic world. But because customers are very price sensitive, they are going to watch out very quickly closely as to whether that is suited for them or not. Imagine you are driving a fast car like a Porsche yeah. or um, Maserati. Maybe you do not want to be monitored all the time based on your driving on German roads. But, you know, you know. Very, what I... very good example. But very fortunately, my my partner will keep me uh, away from uh, from premium rates on, the, on, on rapid vehicles. Um, and Sabine... So, so I, I see that sort of you're providing this differentiated value on top of like through the better, richer data, you're kind of keep, you still have this competitiveness in terms of uh, price. So you really don't have the price differential as easily as maybe some other industries like fashion and luxury. Like this is yeah. not the same. Yeah, you can't you. create like, oh, you only, you know, buy Gucci insurance, right? Like that doesn't, that doesn't, doesn't work. Really well. doesn't work. Um, so um, no, a little bit, let's come back to you. Like one of the reasons I love to have you here is you inspired us originally with like you were one of the first adapters of Relate2 back when you were oh, running yes. Startup Bootcamp, uh, InsureTech, 
in in the UK and US, and um, and then you're you're repeating the the innovation uh, playbook with Alchemy Crew, and I'm really interested in kind of your story of how you were able to build up so much trust, have a community um, of you know these some of the most respected organizations that are looking to you as a kind of a, a connector uh, for for their innovation needs. What how 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 did you manage to pull that off? Because a lot of people want to be in that innovation game, but it, it's really hard to stay in it and stay in it for a long, sustainable time. Well, you stay safe, so you, you need to stick to it. You meet, need to make choices, and then you stick mm -hmm. to it. I've been, I mean, I've been in insurance for 25 years, and I stuck to my industry. I do work with banks and financial service institution, but you know, think about um, banks as. Um, you know, having pension funds and doing asset management like insurance company do. So there's this extension and some of them, you know, when they do mortgage, they need the insurance products as well. So you have this connection between finance and, and insurance as well. I mean, because I've been in, in industry for 25 years and I'm fortunate I've worked before going into InsurTech for big companies, IBM, PwC, Pega. I work with big companies and, in my roles has always been around strategy, translating technology capabilities to make it simpler for executives to understand. Uh, it's always been about value creation, you know, value creation and value realization. So understanding the, the levers of value. And so I've always used some those frameworks, you know, those capabilities in my life. So a reason I think the industry trusts me is I'm, I'm very demanding on myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I read a lot and I believe knowledge is everything. And as you know, I write a lot. I I mean, I'm considered as um, for sure a thought leader and influencer, a tech ambassador and activator in my industry. But the key thing is you give a lot, right? You write mm -hmm. a lot, you read a lot, you actually you process that knowledge. You try to make it simpler for others to understand. And that's that strike the conversations and then you realize, you know, you can actually package that information or that knowledge in different ways to make it easier for those target audience to process because you want them to be successful. Mm. And as long as you focus on other people's success, I think that has always been my, my motto. You know, it's like karma. If you focus on other people's success, it's just come back to you. I think I'm fortunate. Yes, I work with um, insurance companies in Asia, in Europe, United States. And we are trusted in each other. We can talk to each other at two o'clock in the morning. We can go dancing with one another. But that is because of years of dealing value. And they know, whether it's me or my team, we will actually put the hours to get the things done to mm. the highest level of perfection for them to meet their goals, right? Their internal goals and objectives. So, so trust trust is not an overnight thing. It's 25 years of sort of, <laughs> of deep, deep commitment. Now, um, there is something more recent that you're doing, which is a podcast called Scouting for Growth. Yeah. Right. So tell us about it. Tell about the the genesis of, you know, why you started that. And is that expanding your audience? Because I think it does have from from my few listens, you know, not just purely insurance focused conversations. And how are you finding that mix, right? So like the of the, you know, you have the super deep expertise in all things insurance and kind of related areas and finance and, and healthcare. And then, and then now you're expanding a little bit from that to, to broader audience. Yeah. So think COVID, COVID-19 and um, as you do during those times where you're spending so much time at home, you, you just educate yourself and find new things. I was fortunate enough that, you know, part of a group where a lot of those people as part of its tribe are you know very influential people i would not say kardashian influential but pretty influential and the kardashian so, of insurance yeah well the kardashian of um of entrepreneurship let's call them entrepreneurship. Okay. The, the kardashian of entrepreneurship so people mm -hmm. are millionaires and you know they have learned to monetize their brand through various channels and one of them is podcasting Mm -hmm. So one of them said, you know, here's my friend. You need to go and learn how to podcast with this person. I said, okay, let me check it out. And then I, I just took a course, you know, it's like it was two days course. 
Sundays, Saturday, Sunday, where you go deep dive around, you know, what is a podcast and why, you know, podcasting is one of the best things in the world. And when I listened to the stats, I said, actually, that's not, that's not bad. You know, that was three years ago. There was 1.2 million podcasts in the United States. There were only 250,000 podcasts in the UK. It's like, okay, we are 64 million, 65 million people. I mean, if we go look at Europe, you know, I'm probably as big as the United States. So my target market is not small. You know, you go into the calculations. But we are only 250,000 podcasts in the UK. And we had 1.2 million podcasts in the United States. So I said, you know, if you want to get started, you probably need to stop now because everybody will jump on that bandwagon at some point. So I did the course and the nice things with, you know, this group of people is like, I mean, at the end of the day, you're about content. You are not there to like to do the production. We will produce, you just do the content. So you get started and, you know, you, you learn, you know, and I have to re-record some of my earlier podcasts um, because, you know, you do mistakes and it's part of learning. Um, mm to do a podcast and um so over time you find your your voice you find your 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 values and and the Mm. direction because scouting for growth the reason why i put scouting for growth together is was all about venturing and i'm fascinated about corporate venturing because i work with corporate Mm. and i wanted corporates to understand how to venturing better so i talk to vcs a lot right and i work with startups and I work with corporations and I thought, okay, how can we teach that corporate venturing? Because when I look at the numbers, you know, you have 100,000, now probably 150,000 just fintech startups, but only 30% of those guys have raised money. So it's probably they've raised, what, 750 billion, which is not insignificant, but only 30%. So you have 70% of those guys who have not raised money. And I'm not saying everybody wants to fund to fund mm. funding. But so what are the nuggets as to how to find money? Second, you know, what can corporation do for B2B? Because one of my skill, core skills is to work with B2B startups. And so that's the way the genesis of the podcast started. So then I thought, okay, my target market will be corporates, you know, the insurance company I work with, the investors I work with, the startups I work with. You don't want to feed more insurance stuff to those people, I realize as well, because actually they want to learn from other industries. And that's where actually, you know, from talking to insurance people only, I gradually started talking to fintech people, to cybersecurity people, to AI people, because we are trying to solve problems. And if you're actually solving problems, but just talking to people in your naval area, uh, you're not really solving the problem. You're just reinforcing the same message. So yes, you will listen to my podcast. And the key thing is when I have investors, I will have corporates, I will have non-insurance people. I will have cyber AI, you know, and people reach out to me all the time now to be on podcast. So I have to think, you know, do I want you or not on a podcast? Mm -hmm. But one thing which is interesting is, you know, three, no, it's two years, right? I started in January, 2022. So December, 2021 was the launch, launch in 2022. So I'm two years. I'm now at 170,000 downloads. Um, number 30, I think in the UK entrepreneurship and it moves, right? But I'm average mm-hmm. last year, week 30, I'm 250 in the United States. So I'm doing pretty okay, right? Um, after just two years. That's really amazing. I, I think I know why you're doing so well. Um, I think you're just a generous human being. And I think that sort of sounds like a uh, cliche maybe, but I think you're just making, you're creating um, connections, you're being authentic, you're being yourself. And I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to to have you here Thank quite you. Uh, selfishly is just to, to kind of get a little bit of Sabine vibe because we're like a baby podcaster compared to you. <laughs> uh, just kind of like still like trying to figure out what the diapers are and how to put them on. But I think the there's something really special, whether it's in the, in the podcast mode or I think the way you run startup bootcamp, you know, events or or alchemy crew activities that you do is you you kind of have a sense of a community that you're building, and part of that is being open, part of that is being a you know um, real, not pretending, not saying you know, hey, everything is awesome, da 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 da. So it's just it's just very exciting and you know well deserved to see that you're you're spreading out because I think what the way you're doing 
um, things, whether it's an insurance or kind of fintech world, is really like it's just good practice. It's just what good humans, good professionals Hope do. So, so I, thank yeah. you for doing that. And uh, and, and you know, you meet my, amazing a, people, Alex. Mm -hmm. You meet amazing people. Sometimes you know, when I podcast, I meet people. I was like. And we, we become best friends, you know. I know I can reach out if I have, like, any fractional CFO. I can go and find them. And you know what I mean. You end up yeah. creating those connections who are there for you lifelong. I feel that's almost like one of the joys. And you're kind of obviously an entrepreneur yourself in, in, in starting your own businesses and publications. And uh, uh, the, the one of the joys of entrepreneurial journey is that you meet amazing people. And I think the reason I think podcast is interesting, it's almost like a window of a day to day because you and I, we, we, we were just catching up on, on work and opportunities the other day. And so yep. this is, hey, this is us doing some of the same things. On that note, you mentioned AI. And obviously, yes. this is something that top of mind for everyone. Uh, you recently did some work on Wimbledon yep. uh, AI. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us, you know, you know, you already talked a little bit about um, relevance for insurance and kind of simplifying access to complex information. But, you know, you probably have other uh, trends that you're seeing across industries or insure tech as well. Like, let's dive into that a little bit. Everybody's wants to speak to innovators, but you are like the collector of all the innovations. You see all the innovations that are happening in the marketplace. You know, can you can you synthesize some of that for us? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm fortunate that I work with brands who which want to to find you know horizon two and three stuff. And so they, they give me problem statements and my team and I we go and, and find them, you know, think about a mandate, go and find out what is going on on this problem. And then we we solve it by really understanding it, and then by identifying the ventures. You know, a lot of our work has always been with startup ventures, looking at, you know, innovation on the stage, because that shows you where the potential is, partly when you start looking at where investors are putting most of their money. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also look at big tech and big organizations. So when you mentioned Wimbledon, I'm very fortunate that I work very closely with IBM and they invited me at Wimbledon to help me experience Wimbledon. And um, through that experience, I was able to go to the engine room and see all the amazing tech happening at Wimbledon and the generative AI, which, you know, mm -hmm. if you picked up your phone during Wimbledon, you could actually experience a number of features that were launched for the 2023 Wimbledon. You could actually see um, which players uh, you know, literally as they were playing, you know, you will get the commentary and there would be live commentary and there would be generative AI generated. And then you would have the ability to track which winner may win. Um, again, by looking at predictions and sentiment analysis and AI and all those things. And then you could actually see like a decision tree who would win. Now you can't see it, right? Because right. The, the 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 autonomous is finished but if you were on the app you would experience that and that was for me an interesting experience because what you learn is not just about the foundation model it had to be a foundation model for Wimbledon it had to be a secure model using you know valid external data sources because yeah. then imagine you have to provide the information to your fans all around the globe but it was also about governance and so understanding what governance and responsible ai was about so you asked me about the trend yeah you know ai generative ai is a big trend I'll tell you i just finished uh, uh, a keynote for one of the top reinsurers in this world i'm presenting on at one of their conference next week and um I'll say, you know, generative AI didn't start in November 2022. I mean, it's 1950. I mean, it's just started a while ago. It mm -hmm. just didn't pay, you know, people didn't pay attention. You know, for the past years, three to four billion were invested in generative AI startups. Mm -hmm. This year, so far, there's 14 billion has been invested in generative AI. And we believe that it would be 18 to 20 billion by the end of the year. So this is the year of generative AI. Um, and you see a lot of innovation around marketing, you know, your space that you would expect, mm -hmm. you know, around content creation, accelerating content creation, image creation. Myself, I use, you know, Midjourney, but also love using Leonardo AI because Leonardo, for instance, allow me to do prompting 
I'm not an expert prompt, but actually correct my prompts so that I can do the right prompt for the right imagery. Then, so you, you start combining all those capabilities which are around you to actually help you make your job easier, faster. Uh -huh. But what you actually start realizing is orchestration of generative AI is going to be the next big thing. Something helping, you know, when you're today, you have to use this and then you have to use that because it's very difficult then to enable teams with all those tools and knowing which one they have to use when. So AI generative AI is going to be super big, but that entails also cloud, uh -huh. hybrid cloud. So when you start implementing it in a corporate environment, you need the private cloud for your data and the public cloud for external data sources. And you need that architecture to be really, really good. Um, but that also until quantum computing, because now if you apply quantum to that generative AI and that data, then you can actually start making decisions even before you have thought about them, which is right. Well, I think the way we think about this is sort of generative AI is a step to interaction interactive AI effectively where it actually drives interaction and we are kind of a, a little bit you know because we're already taking the images and the text and we're turning them into an interactive experience in some ways we're generating interactive yeah. AI so we we love this trend and I think it's exactly you know when you start pulling together different mini apps into a, a workflow that addresses the need because you're right like somebody innovative like yourself knows what to use for what somebody who may not be as innovative may be overwhelmed by the variety it's of overwhelming tools, you know and then half of them your enterprise doesn't even allow you to use and and, and you know then they, they they use hallucination so we've been very careful at hey we're only taking this content that is approved for this particular um data we can use the language models to interrogated but the content that we're reading is restricted for example right it could be in our case it's in the cloud so we're yeah. not seeing that it has to be it has to be always enterprise has to be in 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 house or in, in kind of um private clouds but i think obviously differs by data sets and and you know what data you're putting in so let's switch a little bit so we talked about ai and technology um obviously the 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 podcast is focused on experiential uh human experiences whatever the industry you know in, in your case you know insurance but let's talk about your experiences um what kind of motivates you so i have a few questions as we kind of head into the uh last few minutes what is uh what is your favorite book in general or maybe something you've read recently that kind of filled you up with insights and, and experiences that you remember and, and, you know, they motivated you in some way, shape or form. So I'm a bookworm. And so I do read a lot. And I, I have to say that as the world we are moving in uh, changes a lot. I think for anybody to spend some time to read, you know, Alex Austin Waters, books around business model design and um, how to build an invincible company and all those things. Those are, you know, things we all need to master as business people. Okay. The one which is on my bedside right now is the economic singularity. And so because I just carry book, you know, it's all about AI and um, it's highlighting as we, as individual, we, we are living in this knowledge economy and so what's going to be the jobs of tomorrow? Mm. You know, think about labor market going to reduce potentially because of generative AI, because of artificial intelligence, not just generative AI. And so what jobs are we going to hold? And it's an interesting thesis because, you know, once upon a time, when you look at the older age, you know, I would have like a big pompon dress and I will be reading philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, are we going back and to smoking. that? smoking, you'll be smoking cigarettes in Café de Philosophe and uh, Rue Montmartre or what? Something, something, something like, like that, that, when you yeah. think about it, right? It will be all about the knowledge. Yeah, we will be talking, uh, it will be great. Huh? Exactly. <laughs> I, get my, I get to do my I do, I French get to do accent. My French bien accent. Sûr, bien sûr, bien sûr. Yeah. Exactement. But think about that. And yeah. so, but at the same time, when you think about, you know, Ford and the period of mechanism where um, 
you know, we had machinery to actually build the cars. We had a period where people lost their job. They were not building the cars, but then we had, you know, new jobs being created. So we are going to go into a phase where it's going to be painful. We call that a luminal phase where we don't know what is going to happen. Um, however, we are going to come out of that. And I think this book is an interesting um, reality check for all of us to really understand our core and what is the values and our purpose in this world, actually. Great, great read. Thank you for the recommendation. All right, next question. Tell us about your most memorable experience as a teenager. As a teenager, oh my goodness. So you talk about- So 10 years ago, 10 years ago, you know, whatever. whatever. 10 years ago, yes. So, you know, it's still in my, my head, but I, I don't smoke. I've never smoked. Uh, but, you know, one thing in France is if you want to be, belong to the tribe, you have to smoke. So I bought my first packet of cigarette and um, I took one and I tried it. It's like, what? WTF, you know, it's disgusting, this thing. So I, I proceed with my pack of cigarette to the school and I ask my, my friends and colleagues about it. And I spent the whole day with that pack and I, I ended up giving it to a friend. It's like, you know, it's not me. I'm never going to smoke. Here, you smoke, take it. So it's a memorable experience because I realized I will never smoke in my life. <laughs> That's great. You, you felt you were true to yourself from, uh, from, from the beginning. Great, great, great foundation of entrepreneur. Um, <laughs> so on that note, um, you know, you're inspiring many other people. Uh, in the industry, myself included, who inspires you? Who do you follow? Who kind of, you know, forces you to say, hey, I can I can do a bit more. I can think differently. Yeah, well, you know, you will probably not be surprised, but, you know, the usual, you know, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, and uh, for sure, when it doesn't annoy me, uh, Elon Musk, I would say. However, you know, as female, you know, um, inspiration, you know, as you bring your, your your personal brand and your authentic brands, you actually have your your uh, go to personalities. Mm -hmm. And mine is Oprah Winfrey. You know, in insurance, mm -hmm. people call me the Oprah of insurance, and I tend to take this very very seriously. For sure, Beyonce, uh, because of woman power. And I would also say Rihanna, because people don't realize, but Rihanna has built many companies, right? You have Fendi mm. and all the things that she's a billionaire and all those things. And what I learned when I look at those personas is, you know, strong women, you know, not pretty, you know, arrogant in their style, but they know how to make money. This is great. Uh, I, by the way, have you started reading uh, the new Elon Musk book yet by Walter no. Isaacson? I, I've got it in my audio book thing and um i think it's you're not. right it, like it puts a perspective on where you can be annoying and where like where you could be inspiring and it's sort of really hard to figure out you know Absolutely. how do you how do you find your own balance um between the i mean it's long term and he's a what is a contrarian let's just be clear yeah. you know when you look at mm -hmm. profile is a contrarian and you need to actually feel comfortable to understand is going to always annoy people in some ways. It is his personality, but he thinks long term. You know, when you look at SpaceX and when you look at Tesla, you have to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to actually acknowledge he's an amazing person, even though sometimes it can be difficult to understand. You just need to you just need to take the best of opera and Elon Musk and something magical might happen. It's that like ability to take <laughs> that division with the humanity uh at an individual level yeah and i think this is great i think it sounds like this is what you're really aiming for big ideas big impact uh but like having a very human uh authentic connection 100%. at the same time and i think this is this is really wonderful and on that note it may it may actually you know you may have already answered it but uh, let me ask the last question um and this is, by the way, a new new way we're trying to to uh, to ask some interesting questions. But if you could have a dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would that be? For me, well, number one would be probably Oprah. Actually, okay, yeah, Oprah Winfrey, or you know, Elon Musk to actually tell him how much he drives me crazy right now. Right, because I'm an influencer, so therefore social media platform are important to me. X Twitter has become a nightmare for many influencers because we don't understand it. Um, 
but it will be a balance between the two. But, you know, look at all those amazing people, right? Richard Branson, if I go to the Caribbean, that would be nice. Bill Gates, I guess, you know, if I'm in the state, Elon Musk, if I go to California, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, I think that actually a friend, friend of mine says that um, uh, Beyonce spent a lot of time for sure in Texas, where she lives, but she goes a lot to Atlanta. So who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I, I am sure, I'm sure they would be delighted to connect with you. Sabine, this has been really fantastic. Uh, where can people find you, your podcasts? Uh, what's the best way for, for our audience to engage with your content or with you? So with me, the best place would be LinkedIn, right? Okay. Sabine Vandalinen. I have the name, Sabine Vandalinen, on LinkedIn. Um, it would be Sabine VDL on Twitter, Instagram, Sabine VDL Official. My podcast is on all major channels. Um, Apple, Spotify is cutting for growth. You know, go and have a look. You know, look at, you know, this past year's content, um, always improving and always taking feedback as well. Because those are long-term projects. It's not something you just dive in and just disappear, right? And by the way, yes, you know, I know I have to record some of my earliest uh, podcasts, but that is on the way. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm I'm love to see how you're innovating, how you're inventing the industry, how you're creating new, bringing new services and products to the market. Uh, look forward to collaborating further, Sabine, and thank you for supporting ecosystem and you know us back in the early days that relate to you. Always, know, you know. always, always have a special place in my heart. The people who support you before you figure out what you're doing, and they just see the potential and bring out the potential in others. And I think that's a great, you know, reputation that you have of bring bring up potential and connecting the dots. So thank you so much for joining us, and uh, please reach out to Sabine uh, if you want to get inspired and if you want to get an edge on what's happening in insurance and broader financial services. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.